Probably a face card is. How many face cards are there? Twelve. Jack, queen, and king in each suit. So jack, queen, king of spades, clubs, diamonds, hearts, three, six, nine, twelve. There are twelve face cards out of? 52 again. So again, just getting started with probability, what it is, you kind of, most people have a sense for what probability is. We're going to be putting a lot more words uh, to this on the next slide and a couple slides after that and talking about some procedures and that we're going to go through, how we're going to translate things from English into probabilistic methods and formulas. Um, but there's our really quick intro in terms of selecting heart, selecting spade. And now this next thing here, this that vertical line, we read that when we're doing probability, we read that as the word given. So this would be read as the probability of a face card given it's a heart. And that's how we would write it. So when you're talking about face card given heart, that means, okay, given heart, now I've reestablished, I've redetermined I'm no longer talking about a deck of cards. I'm only talking about hearts. So whenever we have a given statement, you just have to throw out everything else. And the given means this is all we're talking about. Of the hearts, how many are face cards? How many? Three out of 13. Because there's 13 hearts, three of which are face cards. So that's how that goes. So if you need a second, does anybody need a second to finish up the last few? Just by show of hands, I see no hands going up. All right. So without me talking, what's the next answer? Wait, first I'm going to write it down. Probability of H given F. How many is this? Three out of 12. If you get something different, say, no, nah, I got something different. Uh, probability of S given H out of 13. All right. Probability of H and F. That's what the and is in. It's in quotes there. That's because you're actually going to say the word and. When you see that cap, that cap is, is uh, the word and, and it means intersection. When we get to a Venn diagram, it means intersection. But the cap means and. It's the probability of H and F. In other words, what's the probability of having a card that is both a heart and a face card? What's my answer? Three out of 52. There are three cards that are both Hearts and face cards. King of hearts, queen of hearts, jack of hearts. There are 52 cards. And again, we're still out of 52 in this one because it wasn't a given. If it was a given, that reestablishes my denominator to be whatever it is individually. All right, and then we have down here probability of H or F or is union. All right. And union means it's one or the other or both. So the card that you draw is, I look at it, so whatever cards I have back here, I have a four of hearts. Is this a heart? Yes. Is it a face card? No. Is it a face card heart? No. But it is a heart, so it does count towards my sum total. So, oops, didn't mean to slide that all over. Move back. Doop, doop. There we go. So, how many cards are we talking about? How many? 22. 22. How'd you get 22? Uh, I took the three of hearts as 13 and then added 9. Or, uh, okay, so there's the 13 that are hearts. And then you counted the other face cards, because we already counted the hearts face cards. You count the other face cards, of which there's 9 remaining. There's three in the diamonds, three in the clubs, three in the spades. For a grand total of 22 out of 52. All right. So there's your quick little intro to probability notation.
So then we're going to talk and like define some things. Now, again, I'm recording this, so don't feel obligated to write this down as you go. All right. Uh, why don't you jump in with this group right back here? Yep, just leave that there. Yep, perfect. All right. Um, and your name, son? Christian. Christian, okay. I just got to make sure I change attendance later. Um, so all of these things are just definitions and terms which you can look up in the back, but I'm going to tie it into what we just did with the last problem. So an outcome is something that happens. All right, so an outcome could have been that I draw a card that's the... Uh, four of diamonds, all right? That would be an outcome. How many outcomes did we have? Could have we had from a deck of cards? 52, okay? But an outcome by itself is something that could have happened. I would not write the number 52. That's not an outcome. 52 is how many possible outcomes there are, which we'll get to be when we talk about sample space. But an outcome itself is what's something that could happen when I draw a card from a shuffled deck. I get a card, I get four of diamonds. That is one possible outcome. The sample space, that's all of the outcomes. And I would list it like that, S equals bracket, and then I would, th this would be a long process right now. I would do ace of diamonds, we'll call, I can't even draw a diamond shape. Ace of diamonds, Two of diamonds, that's not a diamond, that's a triangle. Three of diamonds. Right? Da, 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 da. And then I finish up here with uh, jack of uh, spade. Okay, that's a terrible one. The queen of spades and then the king of spades. Once I've listed all 52 of them, that's my sample space. So the sample space is what is everything that could happen? happen. If you roll a die, my, my sample space would be, if I roll a die, I'll just do it over here in a different color. If I roll a die, my sample space would equal bracket one, two, three, four, five, six. Because those are the six possible things that could happen when you roll a standard die. It's a six-sided die. Whenever I say rolling a die, assume it's a standard six-sided die. All right, we're not doing Dungeons and Dragons or anything like that in here, so we don't have like my 12-sided or 22-sided or anything like that dice in here. All right, so the sample space is the list of every possible thing. An event, our, our mathematical language says that an event is a subset of outcomes. What does that mean? Well, if we looked at our outcomes, what's one subset I could do of that? I could have, in this case, one event could have been Hearts. That's a subset of all the possible outcomes. If I looked at just the hearts. So that previous slide that we worked through, we did face cards. Face cards is an event. Hearts is an event. Spades is an event. A red card or a black card is an event. Odd numbers, even numbers, those are different events. So an event is just a subset of the outcomes. All right? Maybe the event is getting the four of diamonds. So it's possible that one outcome is also your event. Could happen. Probability then, which we've already determined, is the likelihood of something happening. I mean, that's your most basic definition of, of a probability, is the likelihood that something happens. I mean, numerically, it's how many ways can it happen, and you'll hear me go back to this. How many ways it can happen When I say it, that it is referring to whatever the event is. The event is this. All right, how many ways can that happen? It can happen this many times. Okay, that's my numerator. And then the denominator is all possible, or how many of the all possible ways? What's the total number of ways that anything could happen at all when you're drawing a card from a deck of cards? 52 possible ways. That was my denominator. And then we have an event and its complement. So I'm going to pause for a second so you can ask me questions. An event and its complement. This isn't like, hey, good job. You did a good job. Complement. This is the complement in terms of it's the event and then the not event. So if I have probability of hearts, which we said was 13 out of 52, probability of 
not hearts or hearts complement would be the, whatever that number is. Is that 39 over 52? Yes. So the complement is not whatever you're looking at. So the complement of hearts is not hearts. And sometimes it's not the dash up there. It'll actually be the C for heart complement. Different authors of different textbooks will write it differently. All right. So a complement is basically just think of it. It's, it's either what I'm looking for versus everything that I'm not looking for. So the probability of any, so if I make up any letter, we say A plus the probability of a complement. So you're saying, what's the likelihood that I pick A or I don't pick A? Well, that pretty much covers everything. So the sum of any event and its complement is always one. All right, why do we care about complements? We'll get to some harder problems later on where the only way to find the problem is actually to come back door and do the complement first, which sometimes can be an easier task. All right, and then independent events. And we t I did it strike through on purpose. We're gonna try to shy away from using the word dependent. It's gonna make sense in probability that you say, oh, they're, they're, they're dependent events. Um, but when we get to further content, when we're doing hypothesis testing and chi-squared testing, um, we're, not, we're never going to say dependent. We're always going to say not independent. And the reason why when we get to that place, and I'll tell you now, it's much like jury trial. You're either guilty or there's insufficient evidence to prove that you're guilty. But a court of law can never say you are guaranteed innocent. They just said there wasn't enough information. You're acquitted. We could not, beyond a shadow of a doubt, prove that you're guilty. Therefore, you are acquitted. That doesn't mean you didn't do it. That doesn't mean innocence is proven. It just means we can't prove. We can prove independent. We and if it's not independent, we say they are, well, they're not independent. And that's how we're going to try to use that language and be consistent. So independent means um, knowing something does not affect the outcome. So for example... From what we did, what was the probability of hearts given face card? Do you remember what that one was? Three out of 12. There's 12 face cards. So knowing it's a face card, three of them were hearts. Okay. What is the probability of hearts? 13 out of 52. Are those the same value? If we were to then actually reduce this, yes, this is a fourth. And this is a fourth. Did knowing that it's a face card change the likelihood of it being a heart? No. So again, given face card, there were three of them out of the 12 that are hearts. Of the whole deck, 13 of them are hearts out of 52. Since these probabilities are the same, that means if I knew that F was true, the likelihood of a heart is the same. That makes them independent. So independent events basically means, well, if I know something, does that change the likelihood of it happening, of whatever I'm looking for? If the answer is no, then they're independent. If knowing something, preceding getting a heart, if this changes the likelihood of getting a heart, then they are not independent. All right. So essentially it means, regardless of face card or not, heart, the probability of heart remains the same. In that case, that means the two events are independent. And we'll have a formula for this here in a second. But before we get there, here's what I want you to do. With your groups, you're going to turn and work on these quickly, or as quick as you can. Uh, suppose 60% of college students are female, 50% of all students have long hair, of all the students, 45% of all students, well, that's redundant. Of all the students, 45% of all students are female students with long hair. Don't know why I wrote it quite that way. 75% of female students have long hair. See if you can find the probability of female, probability of long hair, probability of someone being female and long hair, probability of someone being female or long hair, long hair given that they're a female, 
and male, and long hair. And what I recommend you do is start with something like plug in numbers from here and go through. So what you're going to actually be creating is what's called a contingency table. I'm going to give you a second to see if you can create one first, and then we're going to start using that to find these values. I'll pause for a moment. So with that being, female students with long hair means it's anus. Make a little table. Long hair, short hair, male, female. Do you have any numbers to fill in in the table right now? So which one's 50%? Short hair people are 50% because if half of them are long hair, then half of them are short hair. We're talking people, not like dogs and cats, but... All right, and then of the female, 60% are female, which how many are male? 40%. All right, that's super helpful to know. And again, those totals have to add to that 100% to contingency table. And we were told at the beginning that females are 60%. So right here with the probability of F, that's going to be 0. 0.6. You're going to find me not using percents often when we're talking about probability. I'm going to go back to decimals. Because oftentimes people forget to translate fractions to de or percents back to decimals. But most of the time, we as mathematicians, which you are because you're in this class, we use decimals. When we explain it to people who are not mathematicians, you know, the masses, we change it to a percent. Why? Because most people think they understand percents, even though we all know they don't. All right. What was the percent of long hair? That was 0.5. All right, and then what other nugget of information do they give us that I can fill in in this table? And long here, and means intersection. So this number here is, I turned my pen off, 45%. It's the intersection of all students that have long hair and are female. So it's the intersections where they come together. All right. That means I can now start putting other numbers in. You've all done like those uh, logic puzzles, you know. Mr. Brown has this many things but not, and then his wife misses this, is this and that, and you're like the little crossbar. Anyways, maybe I'm just dating myself. We always did those. But now you can start plugging things in. Yep. So then that means this is 15% right here. Why? Because 45% total females are 16%. So females with short hair is 15% of the population. Total long hairs are 50%. Female long hairs, 45% of the overall population, which means 5% of the males are with long hair. This would then be 35%. And if I've done this correctly... 35 and 15 add to 50. These add across. So at least they all add up. Now the confusing thing is, on that previous slide, it told us that. It said, and I'll do a different color here, 75% of the female students, I can't spell, STDS students, have long hair. So if I think about this, this is M and F, this is L and S for how I define my variables. I need to find out how do I translate this into a probability statement. The probability of, so it says 75% of female students. Is it of all students? It's of female students. So I have given female. I'm only talking about female students. What percentage of female students have long hair? That's 0.75. So given F, how many have long hair? So again, when we're doing this, this is why I'm showing you. It's like how we translate this, how we understand what, what gets where and how things work when we're converting from English to math, essentially. And then you wonder, how does this jive with what's going on here? Well, how many students are females? 60%. What is 75% of 60%? 45. All right, so 75% of the females 
have long hair. So if I know given female, how many are, so we still get the 45%. That is consistent with what this is saying. Because what I did is says 45 out of 60. Of the females, of the 60, how many have long hair? 45 out of 60 do. And if you convert 45 out of 60 into a percent, you're going to get 0.75 as a decimal. So that's how it's consistent with what's going on. So then the other probabilities we were asked to find from that previous slide were probability, well, we already know the probability of long hair. Probability of long hair was given as 50%. Probability of female was given as 60%. 0.6, female and long intersection is really looking at where, where do they intersect, right here. So that's where we're remembering that this female and long and also is interpreted as intersection. Where do those two things intersect? Females intersect long hair at the 0.45. Long hair, female, they intersect right here. We had female or long hair. How many are female? 60%. How many are long hair? 50%. Well, that gives us 110%, so that can't be right. But when I counted the females and I got this 60%, I counted this one and this one. When I counted long hairs, I counted this one and this one. Well, I counted this one twice. So if I'm going to do female or long hair, that would be here, here, and here. Because I'm either long hair, this is long hair, this also is long hair and female, and then this one's just female. So these three give me long hair or female in a contingency table. Long hair, we were asked to find probability of long hair given female. Given female, 60%. How many are long hair? 45. So 45 out of 60, which we already covered. That's the 0.75. And then the last one we were asked to find was probability of male and long hair. And you're looking at that, and everybody all together can look at that. You're not going to shout it out yet, but when I point at you, you'll shout out what the answer is for those that are male and long hair. And the answer is? Way to shout that out, the lamest shout. But yes, 0.055%. It's where male intersects with long hair. So a contingency table is one method that I can use to organize information. Another method is a Venn diagram. Males. Females. Long hair. Short hair. The grand total female total is 60%. Grand total males is 40%. So whatever number that I have here, here, and there in those three little intersection places must add up to 40%. Whatever I have right here, right here, and right here, those three must add up to 60%. Well, here's the thing, though. Can I have a female that's neither short hair nor long hair? Based on this example, no. So this is not a thing. I should probably just erase it. And then there's no males that are neither... So in this case, doing a Venn diagram might not have been the quickest way to get there, but you could still get to the same place. Right. And it would have been finding the same numbers that we had in the Venn diagram, or in the contingency table. Another way to organize our information is a tree diagram. Tree diagram says, all right, this is female, this is male. So this is 0 0.60, this is 0 0.40. And then what we don't have, but this is kind of what these go out here. So this would be... What this number is out here is uh, fe that's a P. female and long. So this would be long hair, short hair, long hair, short hair. This would be female and short. This is male and long and male and short. So you can start plugging things in. We found out that uh, what were some of the numbers that we had. As you can tell, I got my head stuck on a contingency table. 
Um, and I'm trying to translate it into a tree diagram. Um, probably the two most common ways that most people find to organize is going to be either a, like this, a tree diagram or a contingency table. It just all depends on how you think through it. Um, this one here, when you're talking about this probability, this is the probability of L given F. This is the probability of S given F. And the reason why it's given F is because that's what's on this leg of the table, uh, of the table, of the tree diagram. Get my words confused. All right, so then here's the two basic rules. There, and, and I mean, there's more slash other ways of writing it, but here's the two basic rules in probability. The probability of A or B. That's the or rule. The or is adding. Now think of that contingency table. Females or long hair. We said, well, first we found the probability of females. We added to that the probability of long hairs. And then we had to subtract away that intersection because we counted it twice, remember? When we were going down that contingency table, we said, okay, females, or sorry, long hair was 5% and 45%. And then females was 45 and 15. Well, I added the 45 twice, so I have to subtract it away once. But in terms of then using all the different values, depending on which one we're given, the probability of the first plus the probability of the second minus the intersection. And the minus the intersection is because I counted it twice. And probability of and is the probability of A times probability of B given A. We've done this. We've done this. This formula sometimes is given as a third formula that ends up being the exact same formula where they solve it and say, oh, the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A. Well, all they did was took this formula, divided both sides by probability of A, to get then the other part. So it can be done either direction. So if you're trying to find a given probability, you can use this. I mean, really, you can use this and just do algebra to solve for the given. But those are our two basic rules. So if you go back to any of the problems that we already did, we could apply those formulas. But what I first wanted to do is get you to see, okay, here's a basic example. We're dealing with uh, a deck of cards. Uh, and, and from that, kind of arrive at these ideas as opposed to just saying, here's the definitions and here's the formulas. Let's go with them. All right. So this just gives you the preface to what the chart is on the next page. Um, it's about the emotional health index scores, EHI scores. Um, from Okay, so it's outdated. It's 2012, but you're going to get the idea. Um, they randomly sampled an emotional score index for various careers, and it looked like this. All these down here. So if you were in, if you're a business owner, you and however they scored it, uh, a business owner here looks like you're about 81 point. 81.7, something like that. And that was your emotional health index. Uh, what it's actually measuring is irrelevant when you're, because what they're really looking at in a case like this is how do they compare to the others? So then going through and saying, well, what is the probability? You know, so sometimes you're going to be given graphs, and how do I pull probabilities off of that? What's the probability that an emotional health index score is 82.7? Well, how many of them are 82.7? Uh, this one and that one. There are two. That's not a probability, though. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 2 out of 14. So the probability of having an emotional or an EHI of 82.7 is 2 out of 14. That's again, how many are what you're looking for out of how many are there possible? In this case, there's 14 different randomly selected. This, of course, doesn't represent every possible career that's out there for an emotional health index. Find the probability that an emotional health index score is 81. Where's 81? Here's 81. We go up from 81. That one's close, but it's slightly under, so the answer is zero. It's possible that you'll get zero, because how many of them are exactly 81, and if there are none, the answer is zero. More than 81, you can start doing that. Well, then 81 is there, so it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, half of them, 7 out of 14. So you get the basic premise there of what's going on. Um, 
It's going to ask the other information, like what's the range of the data? Maximum, minus, minimum. I'm trying to tie in some past chapter's content. Um, it's, I don't think I asked for it up here in, a, in general, but you could say, well, what's the, what's the first quartile value? What's the median value? So the median value, because there's 14, the median will between, be between the middle two. So again, we're going to start talking probability. We're going to talk some other things, but we're always going to be drawing back in some of these past chapter concepts because this is today all of chapter three in a nutshell that we've covered. Um, probability will rear its head when we get into hypothesis testing. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time in hypothesis testing and that will rely on some of the concepts of probability. So what you're completing then in the check your understanding page for chapter three is go to that page in the module. You're going to see the chapter three check your understanding page and it'll list problems that you're going to work on. You're doing that on your own. Again, if you get to a place where you have questions, just reach out to me. Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays so far, it seems like I'm here most mornings. Um, or other times if you need help with doing problems. I've graded a bunch. You should go back and look. If it allows you to resubmit, go ahead and keep resubmitting. Um, at some point, some assignments close, and then you can no longer resubmit. I can't remember which ones are set which way, honestly. Um, and if you have been forgetting to submit things, you should really be looking at the first landing page on our, on our uh, Canvas page. That's our syllabus. It tells you the details of everything that's due and when it was due or is due. Follow, I mean, that's your number one place to go to make sure you're hitting all the things that when they're due, they're due. Looking ahead to when things are due. And then working those check your understanding questions.